We are going to be having a conversation about law enforcement and hate crime prosecutions. Uh, let me bring up to the uh, table our panelists. First, uh, Teresa Buess, the Assistant ADA from the Fort Bend County DA's office. <laughs> Additionally, uh, Chief Eric Robbins, the City of Sugarland Police Department. Finally, uh, O'Neill Brown, who is a uh, federal uh, FBI agent with the FBI. O'Neill? All right, so before we, well, to get started, why don't we first introduce our panelists in a little bit more detail and have them explain to you a little bit about what brought them to this panel discussion and what they, uh, sort of their expertise on the subject of hate crimes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Therese Boos. I'm an assistant district attorney currently assigned to the Public Integrity Division of the Fort Bend County DA's office. I am a 28-year uh, prosecutor. Uh, this is my career. I have loved what I have done. Um, I love working with witnesses and presenting evidence to juries and talking with juries and teaching them about the law and hopefully working to see that, that some kind of justice is achieved at the end of a trial or a case. Um, I have pretty much spent the bulk of my career doing child abuse prosecutions. Um, I've bounced back and forth between the Child Abuse Division in Harris County, and I have most recently been serving as the Deputy Chief of the Child Abuse Division here in, in Fort Bay County. And I've also spent another bulk of my career doing public integrity work, um, which sometimes encompasses the hate crimes area, uh, typically some of the color of law violations um, that we deal with. And I am the new chief of the newly created public integrity division for the Fort Bay County uh, Attorney's Office. Uh, Brian Middleton has created the, the uh, division and has um, tasked our small group um, with looking out for uh, violations that, uh, or complaints of violations of the law made by public officials. I'll pass it on. That's a lot. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Robbins. I am the police chief for the city of Sugarland, and I've been with the city of Sugarland for about 28 years. Uh, so I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of things that's happened, a lot of development and a lot of growth in Fort Bend County. I think our DA mentioned it earlier that this is the one of the most diverse counties in the country, if not the diverse. Uh, with the city of Sugarland, uh, I talk about this quite a bit, and I'll, I'll probably mention this more. Is uh, we're, our mission is obviously to de deliver quality law enforcement services throughout the, the uh, city, but it's also about developing partnerships and, and what we believe is having partnerships with multiple agencies, multiple uh, organizations, associations, and affiliations that's out to do justice in, in our communities. That's way, that in those types of ways is how we believe, is how we keep our community safe. Uh, our department is a truly diverse uh, police department. And one of the things that we, we truly work on is providing training and education we work with our partners with the Anti-Defamation League, who is here in the room, and Stina Marks here, and Sue Hostein, some great partners of mine. But we also work with our community. We have a diverse community with our Muslim population, our Islamic population, our Chinese population, and so forth. So our job is to build those relationships and develop respect uh, for those relations, for those partners, and get them to understand that we are here as a resource for them to uh, it, to share whatever thoughts and, of course, obviously to investigate and, and hopefully apprehend and, and get any kind of offenders, whether it's hate crimes or any kind of criminals off the street in the city of Sugarland. So I'm, I'm just uh, ecstatic to be on this panel, but I'm also ecstatic to be a part of the community that I, I love so much. I'm a native Houstonian born right here in the Houston community, uh, grew, grew up in Houston. So uh, my kids and my family is here. Uh, this is just one of those communities that I believe it is very important for us to continue to have these kind of dialogues and these kind of relationships. So I'll pass the mic for that. Good morning, everyone. My name is O'Neill Brown. I'm a special agent with the FBI Houston Field Office. I've been a special agent with the FBI since 2010, where I've investigated a variety of crimes, 
including uh, white collar crimes, bank fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, and also civil rights violations. And when I talk about civil rights violations, I talk about color law cases, which are cases involving uh, police misconduct, excessive force cases, and also, of course, why we're all here today, which is to dis discuss hate crimes. So it's truly an honor to be here with uh, our law enforcement partners, our prosecutorial partners, and also our community uh, engagement groups. Okay. All right, well, the way this is going to work is that we're gonna ask the panelists a series of questions about hate crime prosecutions and how they actually work on the ground level and ha what happens from the start of a case to the end of the case. But I wanna encourage people in the audience to ask questions that they may have because I think those are the most fruitful and productive conversations we get from that. But before we get into that part of it, why don't we just start opening it up by first asking the panelists the question of what really is a hate crime as opposed to, say, a bias incident? Turn it over. Right, so I'll start with that one. And um, so I'll, I'll kind of rephrase the question to what's a hate crime versus what we call a, a traditional crime. And I always, when I give this presentation, I use a quick example I use with two individuals we call Adam and Billy, right? We'll say Adam and Billy, um, they've known each other since they're about five years old. They grew up together, went to first grade together. And now they're about 20 years old and they still know each other and live in the same community. One day Adam walks up to Billy and Adam pulls out a hammer and says, you know what, Billy? I remember when we were in the first grade, you stole my lunch. Adam pulls out the hammer, he hits Billy in the stomach with the hammer says, that's for stealing my lunch when we were in the first grade. In that example, what you're probably looking at is a traditional crime, maybe an assault, and ag assault, depending on Billy's injuries. We take the same set of facts, Adam and Billy, known each other since they've been five years old, grew up together, except this time, the day before, Billy had recently revealed that he's homosexual. This time, Adam pulls out a hammer out of his pocket, he walks up to Billy and says, you know what, Billy, I never really liked homosexuals. Adam hits Billy with the hammer. That case, that would be an example of a hate crime, or what I like to call it, a bias-motivated crime. So that's how I, I kind of, in my mind, distinguish between a hate crime and a crime and con criminal conduct that would be traditional offense. Thank you. In the city of Chevrolet, what we look at is, we look at what some of the, the actual factors that's involved. Just because someone says it's a hate crime, it doesn't make it a hate crime, but even if they does not say it's a hate crime, that doesn't mean it's not. So what we look at is some of the motivating factors, some of the issues that's involved in, in for a specific, what is the relationship to the, from the offender to the victim? Where, is the victim uh, uh, part of any type of religious group or any ethnic group, any culture group? What are some of those factors? And so this is the training that we provide to our officers is they have to ask what we call guiding questions. Where were they coming from? How do you know the victim if you know them? How do you know the offender? Are you a part of any of these groups that we talk about? Are you have any kind of affiliation that we can associate? And then our officers have to look at those. And then what we will do is we will classify these particular incidents as a hate crime once we can identify those factors. And then we will investigate it from that perspective. And what Chief Robbins has talked about is evidence. He's, he, he's training his officers to ask the proper questions to ferret out the evidence that we as prosecutors, both federal and, and at the state level, are going to need to make a hate crime. So a, a crime is a crime. A hate crime has something additional to it. And it requires the same kind of proof that we always have to have going into a courtroom, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a very stiff level. It's the highest level of proof that we have in the United States system. And so the evidence becomes very critical when we're trying to prove that a crime was committed because of factors such as race, color, disability, age, national origin, ancestry, gender, or sexual preference. Those are sometimes things that we may, we may know as individuals, common sense we can look at and we can say, we know this crime was committed for this reason. However, putting the proof behind that sometimes becomes a very difficult thing. Let me follow up that question with this. Um, is every instance or expression of hate that someone may receive, is that a hate crime? So for example, if someone rolls down the window of their driving and yells at a group of people about their ethnic or racial or whatever status, is that actually a crime? Let's 
start with you. <laughs> Good question. I would say it's not a crime until we can identify those key factors. I mean, if someone makes an, an outcry, an accusation, or a statement like you were just mentioning, what we have to do is qualify those statements because, you know, you can have some someone just having a party or someone just having a, a, a an incident in a day or something and making some words, but what we want to do is to qualify those statements. And the way we qualify those is just to look at those patterns, look at the history, look at like we were talking about some of the evidence, who they belong to, where were they coming from? Did they just come to the area? Are they new to the area? Are they familiar with the association and the people that they're around? And so we have to look at those issues and then we have to qualify those issues. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, what actually happens when there actually is a criminal act that you think might be motivated by hate or race or bias of some sort. How do, how do you proceed? And maybe just go to law enforcement directly first. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the middle for a reason. <laughs> go ahead. No, I'll start off with this one. But you, you start off like you would any other, any traditional investigation, in terms of trying to find out exactly what it is, what happened. So you get, obviously you get a, a victim statement, about the victim about exactly what happened. And the victim statement is important. Primarily, the sooner you can talk to the victim, when it's fresh in your mind about what happened, what, how did you come to meet the defender of the state? What did the offender say? Because in, in all crimes, words matter, right? Give me the money, give me the money now. You know, people establish a pattern of how they say things over and over again. But in hate crimes, words really, really do matter, right? Because it goes to the bias motivation, the offender's mindset when he's committing the crime. So it starts with a, a victim statement, getting from the victim, what happened? What did the offender say? What was he doing? And it's, 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 a, it's, it's a delicate and it's an interesting process. And it's sometimes very, um, challenging for the victim to have to go over this in detail. I mean, he kicked you, what did he say after the first time he kicked you? You know, and this is a, from a victim's standpoint, this is a horrible event that they went through and now we've got to take him through it. Literally, blow by blow, injury by injury, because it matters to us in terms of proving our case, what was being said at the time. So it's very important, even though it's very hard for victims sometimes, it's very important for us to developing the evidence. Um, obviously also get witness statements, people, you know, non-neutral third parties who were also there who may have also witnessed it, video evidence, cell phones, things you would get in a traditional investigation and trying to establish the, um, the victim, about the victim's background, also trying to, number one, identify the offender, and once you have an offender identified, finding out as much as you can about the offender's background, and again, things you would normally do, the offender's criminal history. Does he have any other instances where he's committed this kind of conduct in the past? Maybe he has um, some assault cases from years back, but if you look at these assault cases, they involve individuals who are all, always Muslim for, for some reason, right? So you look, establish a pattern about the offender. You also look at the offender's statements that he said, not only when the crime was being committed, but maybe beforehand. Was he posting things online, on Facebook, his historical uh, Twitter accounts? And then also you look at the offenders, maybe try to get the offender's phone and see the text messages and things that he was being sent out contemporaneously to when the crime was being committed. What was he saying to his friends? Where was he going that night? Why was he going there that night? What was his plan? And then also that obviously, what did he say after? What did he tell his friends? What did he tell his families? What did he tell other co-defendants if there are any about what happened? Those are ways you kind of go about establishing um, a hate crime case. And the only thing I would add to that is regardless of, you know, what he was talking about from our standpoint is more into our investigation standpoint, but regardless, when someone calls us to make a report about a particular crime, we're going to take the report. We're going to make that offense and we're going to document it. And then we will determine if we have to after the fact of, you know, how we classify this particular case. And it's going to be based on all those factors that he was just saying. So we're going to, we, we encourage everyone in our community particularly in Sugarland, but in our community, if you come in our city and if you have any kind of issue that you believe is criminally related or even just suspicious, to let us know and then we will take the lead on that part and continue with the investigation. All right, so if something happens to, let's say I am a victim of a crime, somebody just, something just happened, do I go on my phone and look up the number for the FBI to figure, or do mm -hmm. I, what, what do I do? What, what's the victim do? <laughs> Call your local jurisdiction police department. Call 911 if it's a serious emergency. That's the first thing to say. Dial 911. Uh, but in any case, call your local jurisdiction. And it's our case, and that's why we have great partnerships 
with the Fort Bend District Attorney's Office. And in some cases, it's whether it's Harris County, Montgomery County, or whatever county you're in, but those are the particular uh, jurisdictions that you have to follow. So again, if it's you, if it's anyone, just pick up the phone and call the local police department. The district attorney's office has attorneys that are on call 24 hours a day, and we partner with all of our local law enforcement agencies in Fort Bend County, as well as some from Harris County. Um, and we provide um, whatever resources, whatever advice we can, so that when these kinds of things happen, we, we might ask a question that might trigger an additional question that might help make a case uh, a stronger case when it comes to hate crimes. So let's pretend that I'm a victim, again, of a hate crime. Are you guys going to investigate my background? Are you going to investigate me? That's one of the concerns I think victims sometimes have in reporting hate crimes. That's a great question. What we look at is just we're going to have to ask you a, lot, a series of questions. But as far as a background investigation, the answer to that off the bat is no. What we're, what we're trying to do right now is just get the facts. Once we have a particular offender, then of course we're going to look at that offender's background. We're going to look at their history and those kind of things. But we're not necessarily going to look at the victim unless there's some circumstances that, that dictates that. But right now, the, the primary concern for law enforcement from our standpoint is getting the facts. Get the facts, find out what happened, and then let's go after the actual perpetrator and the offender. So those are the people that we will be checking. I think our statistic is 95% of the cases that, that are actually filed, that come through the court system, are resolved with plea bargains. So they're, they're agreed um, pleas and the, the cases are disposed in one way or another. That, that other 5% that actually go to trial, I always talk with our victims and I mean obviously they're, they're not happy about, no one is ever happy about coming to court and having to talk in front of a jury or a judge. That, I mean, that's life. We try to make it as protected and safe as possible. Um, from the very beginning, when law enforcement becomes involved, there's a crime victims uh, coordinator who is involved that provides information that's available at the, at the table on your way out, pick up a brochure. Um, we have, within the district attorney's office, we have crime victim coordinators who meet with victims of these types of crimes. They're there with them every time they come to court, and they're welcome to come to court every time that there's a court setting. Um, the, dis the assistant district attorneys who are tasked with trying these cases to juries, they will meet with those witnesses. They will prepare them, and, and part of preparation is education. You know, people have these fears about what's going to happen at trial. They, they watch TV shows that are not terribly accurate. Um, so part of what we need to do is educate our victims and, and our witnesses as to what's going to happen in a courtroom. And in all honesty, sometimes a person's background may come up. Sometimes it becomes relevant as far as inciting or causing part of the problem. And, and it may be relevant within a courtroom. And we talk about that and we prepare our witnesses and our victims for those type of things. And we shield them as best we can, but the reality is there are times where we just all need to know what we're dealing with. And, and most of the times um, I find working with, with witnesses, um, they're understanding, they know that this trial is not about their background necessarily. Um, but that they're there to tell the truth, what, what we expect from all of our witnesses. So let me ask you this. Um, does it matter if a victim is, doesn't speak English or is not a U.S. citizen? How does that come into play in y'all's investigation of a crime, of, of a federal of a crime? So from a, a federal standpoint, the, the victim's naturalization status is not a factor. A victim is a victim regardless of whether they're a U.S. citizen or they're a resident or they're a visitor. They are a victim of a crime because something really bad happened to them. Um, and if they don't speak English, uh, we have translators. If they speak Spanish, we have the translators. Uh, we have a floor of translators that speak a variety of languages, most of which I don't even know what they do up there. But we have those translators available if you need them. So that's not something the victim should be concerned about. Um, if something bad happened to you, Call 911, call the police, and we'll find someone that will be able to speak to you. 
let's talk a little bit about how the federal and the state relationship is. What can you tell us a little bit about how the feds and the state uh, agencies work together in prosecuting a hate crime or any crime, really? Oh, that's a that's a big one. But I'll I'll, I'll start off with how I work with federal uh, and local partners, and I have a great relationship with the local partners I work with, whether it be individuals at the Harris County DA's office, whether it's investigators at the Harris County Sheriff's Office or Fort Bend. I have a great relationship with the, the local partners whenever I need something, uh, trying to find out what happens. Because these cases are often very complex. I start off with a very fundamental example of Adam or Billy, but uh, some cases are just like that, right? Maybe some instances it's more um, clear it's a hate crime, or in other cases, it's not as clear, and maybe going uh, state charge is the better route. But it's um, these are a difficult fact patterns that I try not to have victims worry about. That's our job to work with uh, myself, to work with our local counterparts uh, to find out what happened. But it really is a um, it's intricate dance of figuring out the facts and what venue would be the appropriate venue to have the best resolution possible. And it's an intricate dance. There's no easy way to answer it because it changes uh, case by case depending on the victim, the facts, the offender, how it happened, where it happened, the injuries, there are a number of different factors that come into play to answer a question like that, to be quite honest. I'll just say this, I won't speak on the prosecution part, but from a, a local and a federal standpoint, we do have a great relationship with our federal partners. The FBI, as a matter of fact, has a, a satellite office in our police department. So anytime we need a, a assistance or support on a, a specific investigation, we literally have someone assigned to the task force that's uh, in our police department, but also we have that rapport where we can sit down and open up with discussions about any particular case. And I think the chief of that uh, uh, spe special satellite office is right there, Richard Renison, who is uh, the FBI supervisor and chief of that office. And the same thing goes for prosecution. Uh, there are times where um, a, a hate crime is a perfect example where um, a federal prosecution may get the bigger bang for the buck. Um, or there have been times where the state prosecution seems to net us a bigger bang for the buck. We have a larger range of punishment available to us. Um, those are all things that, that are thought out and discussed and, and then the choice is made. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. What is the difference in the laws of the state and the feds regarding a, a hate crime prosecution. What advantages does it sometimes go with the, going with the state and then with the feds? So on the state side, um, we, we have kind of a narrow, I think a narrower perspective than the federal side. Um, we have offenses against the person, uh, homicide, kidnapping, trafficking of persons, uh, sexual offenses, as well as assaultive offenses. And then the crimes against property include arson, criminal mischief, and graffiti. Those plus that bias, that reason behind why those crimes got committed, those constitute the state hate crimes. Um, what we get out of those is you, you look at each of those crimes and that the bias bumps up that crime <coughs> to the next level. So if it's a second degree felony, which is a two to 20 term in prison, if it's a hate crime, that second degree would be bounced up to a first degree, which could be five to 99 years or life in prison. So you can see how, how having a hate crime incurs a larger penalty range as it should be. Um, so th that's the, the state, um, and I've already gone through the biases, the, the um, the beyond a reasonable doubt portion that we have to prove <coughs> on top of the underlying crime. Okay. And that beyond a reasonable doubt is something I want to touch upon again. I think we, we touched upon it earlier, but something I want to reiterate. Um, sometimes when crimes happen, we all have a, a hunch or a suspicion or a feeling that it might be a, a hate crime, right? Maybe it's uh, the offender and the victim of different races, or maybe there's some other factor in there. Um, those hunches are, are good to have from an investigator standpoint, but in order to prosecute a federal hate crime or a hate crime, any hate crime, we actually need evidence. So we have to go beyond suspicion in terms of evidence, preferably admissible evidence, as my prosecutors often remind me, admissible evidence that you can use in court to prosecute a hate crime. And, and the, the punishment rate from a federal standpoint kind of depends on the crime and the, 
the injury to the victim. It could be anywhere from probation up to the death penalty, anywhere in between that, depending on the crime that happened, the injuries, did it result in death? It just depends on each case and the victim, uh, their injuries, and if ultimately if they even died as a result of the attack. Why don't we talk about what are the, some of the difficulties you found in prosecuting hate crime, specifically focusing on that intent aspect and how to prove it? Um, so, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a little bit, and you do a lot of interviews and a lot of interrogations, and uh, people are smart, people watch TV, even if they do really dumb things, offenders do. Rarely have I ever walked into an interrogation and I've sat down and they go, you know what, they got me, I did it because they were gay, right? They're not dumb. They're going to give you any other reason but the bias motivation you need because, understandably, they don't want you to go to jail, right? That's how it's played. So it's our job to actually find and ferret out that evidence wherever it exists. And sometimes it's historical. We talked about the offender's background earlier. And the chief talked about if something happens, calling 911. And that's something I tell my family members too, because if you call the FBI, or you call me right now, I can't come right now because I'm on a hate crimes panel in Sugarland, right? But if you call 911, a police officer will be there within minutes. So it's very important to call 911 to file that report, because that report becomes important when you have to go back and dig into the offender's background, because he's gonna go, no, no, no. I didn't hit Billy with the hammer because he was gay. I hit Billy because he stole my lunch. I'm going, that goes. You know what? That's great. I get it. But what about when you hit Charlie two years ago? He was also gay. And what about Dylan? And you start laying out all these reports in front of him, and you see a pattern. But if, if Charlie doesn't call the police and report it, and Dylan doesn't call the police and report it, even though you may feel like nothing is being, very done, nothing is being done, it's very important to report it so you have a... a a fact, a factual basis, a documented statement of what happens that we can later use if need be to prosecute that offender. Yeah, I think I see a question out here. Go ahead. I've been really into to ask my question. So I'm a social worker. I work with, uh, with the population of refugees, immigrants, undocumented immigrants. And you, I know y'all are advising us to call or advise them when we want to advise them to call 911, to call the police. But how do we build that? community trust in law enforcement because many of our clients are scared of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Many of them are scared to call 911, mm -hmm. uh, especially somebody that can't speak English because I, mean, I know the chief of the police and the big, the big the people on the top might be teaching us all this, but a lot of times the officer on duty that comes, they're fearful of the bias that that officer may have towards them too. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do, I mean, I know y'all do a lot of diversity And uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, when you're dealing with individuals from the refugee community or from different populations, they may be coming from places and countries where they have law enforcement that was very corrupt, um, that did very corrupt acts. So when they come here, that's their background and they're where they're coming from, and that's why they may be hesitant to call police. And for also being quite honest, I'm here today on behalf of the FBI, but there are also fe other federal agencies, other federal entities involved, and other stakeholders why you understand why certain other communities don't want to be involved or have contacts with law enforcement. And how do you bridge that? I don't know, there's no easy answer to, to, to answer that question. But how we start is by people such as yourself kind of maybe acting as the mediator and the go-between between people who are very hesitant to call law enforcement and then between people like yourself and others who are in this room who have the education to know that no, there are people that want to hear what happened to you and care about what happened to you Maybe if you act as that bridge, we can at least start walking in the right direction. But it's a hard, it's going to be a hard task. <laughs> we know statistically that only 50% of hate crimes are ever reported. It's a cycle. There's a cycle. And, and you all being here as stakeholders within Fort Bend County, this is the first, hopefully, a, a part of trying to break that cycle. Um, you know, we're, we're educating, we're trying to let people know how these cases are handled, um, the, the, the safety factors that, that are in play here. Um, go back out to your community and let them know, please. We're, you know, 
these things these things hurt not only the victims they hurt the entire community they truly do and you know there's we, we are here to protect law enforcement is here to protect and we need to we need to work together to safeguard a safe society I think I see a question back there. Yes, ma'am. So I run the FBI Media and Community Outreach, and so we do a lot of community outreach. And please invite us to your organizations and your groups for visibility, precisely so that we can make ourselves known. We can come in and talk about any type of program that you want, awareness, education. And for us, that's trying to bridge that gap. I do a lot of outreach among the Hispanic community, the Spanish-speaking only community. We do that with our Muslim community. Um, through any group. So we are open. We have an online form that you can fill out to invite us to your groups, and we will talk about anything you want precisely to build that trust. So I think I saw a question over there. Yes, ma'am. I feel like the elephant is in the room is immigration status, and if somebody is undocumented and they come forward as the victim of a crime, can they be assured that they will not be deported or that their family members will not become caught up in immigration? related investigations and from the local law enforcement standpoint that's not our role it's not our role to enforce the immigration our role is to investigate the crimes she you, you all made some good points and the only thing i can do is kind of echo what they're saying but in in our jurisdiction you know it's i started off saying we have to develop partnerships and we have to have these relationships even in our community with our chinese uh, community we have what we call a chinese hotline and on that hotline we literally have uh, members from the Chinese community to man this this hotline to try and deceive this information and try to uh, hopefully answer these kinds of questions about what it is that law enforcement do. We have our Citizens Police Academy. We have various opportunities. We go out and speak at multiple uh, events, uh, multiple, uh, whether it's with the Jewish community, Muslim community. Uh, we want to talk to those uh, 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 individuals in those communities and just let them know that we're here as a resource, but we do understand that, that there's going to be some apprehensions. And like we're saying, we just have to break down those barriers. We have to, and from my perspective as a police chief, as administrator, we have to continuously provide training for our officers as we come into law enforcement. We understand that this culture is a little bit different over the, over the history of law enforcement. It's, it's always been a, a little bit close-knit, and, and we get people from outside of our country, whether they're refugees, immigrants, they have a different perspective about law enforcement, so we have to do everything we can. It's incumbent upon us to break down those barriers. So that's what we're trying to do, whether it's here, whether it's at any event, we want to try to break down those, uh, those barriers. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sorry, I should add also, there are also visa protections that you can get uh, for people who are not here legally, um, but we do not take our victims to try to prosecute them uh, for, not, for, their, uh, for their immigration status. It's not, it's not our business. Uh, there was a question. There's a lot of questions, which I love. Uh, I think I think I saw your question first. Okay, so there there are definitely a lot of victims that are very fearful of reporting a hate crime, fear of their privacy being breached, right? Uh, fear of retaliation. What kind of tools do you have available in terms of like increasing patrols of the neighborhood, protecting the victim, their family, but also the also the ability to like mask their name, make them a John Doe. Right. Obviously, the defendant knows who they are, mm -hmm. but they're really worried about, well, I don't want my family name kind of dragged through this this incident. I don't want there to be like copycat people. What kind of tools are available for that? That's a, that's a question, and, and we work closely with the district attorney when it comes to developing pseudonym names and, and those kind of names uh, for our victims, and it just depends on our specific crimes, and our district attorney actually gives us those, those guidelines, so I'll let them kind of uh, touch on that, but when you talk about just extra patrols and stuff like that, and I can't speak for every law enforcement agency in, in all the counties and all the jurisdictions, but in my jurisdiction, we will make that uh, resource available for all our victims of any type. Of, if there's a need to uh, come by and do extra patrols or post patrols, or if you want to let us know what's going on when you're leaving your home, when you're coming back, if you're going to be going out of town or out of the country for quite a period of time, we will take that uh, to note and make sure we can watch your house and make sure there's nothing going on there. Okay, question? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question that's come up recently with some of my clients. On the victim intake forms at any level, whether it's the local, state, federal, county level, are, is there a question about the victim's immigration status? 
No, not that I know of. I've never seen that, never. I would like to continue answering the question about safety of the victims. Um, once a charge is filed, um, bond conditions are typically uh, requested. And when we have offenses such as hate crimes, uh, we will typically ask for conditions such as no contact. So the, the charged person, the defendant, would be ordered by the court, should they make bond, uh, to not have any contact at all with, with the victim in this case or their immediate family. There are other pr protections that a judge can put in place that are provided in the Code of Criminal Procedure of Texas. Um, and once those are violated, then the bond conditions can be re the bond can be revoked, and the defendant the defendant can be housed in jail until the case is finalized with a trial or a plea. So those are things that I tell victims about um, when they're fearful of, of their defendant. The pseudonym typically comes into play for us in Texas when there's a sexual crime. And we, we protect uh, the name of, of the victim. We do our best with our search warrants here in Fort Bend County to also protect um, the, the we, we try to mask sometimes the identity of the victim and the family of the victim. Um, but can an average citizen use a pseudonym if they're a victim of a crime? Typically not. There's not a provision in the penal code for that at this time. That may be something that we could talk with the legislature about in the next couple of years. I think there was some years. effort last year or so. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I did not hear what she followed up with. Do you want to talk about that? Basically, she was asking, is there a potential for a pseudonym for any, uh, victim. For, for any victim? And that's really not just limited to hate crimes. But typically, the way that works is that for sex crimes, mm -hmm. uh, that that's a pseudonym that's available. But there's discussion about that, whether legislation, additional legislation is needed on the state level for that. Is there a question? Any more questions? Mm -hmm. no. I, have one. I just had a little just for clarification. Regarding the uh, inquiry about status, immigration status, there are certain pieces that will protect victims of hate crimes, specifically the reason so. Uh, so in partnering with law enforcement, we will also be trying to reach out to immigration attorneys and immigration <coughs> services because those statements that you make to law enforcement regarding any hate crimes are the exact statements that can uh, open up a visa opportunity for an individual within this country. So you have to pretty much just, if that occurs, a hate crime occurs, also reach out to immigration specialists and immigration attorneys to help you with not only reporting the crime, but also for the uh, immigration um, adjustment and protections that could come as it, uh, as it relates to being reported. And typically, at least in a federal prosecution, the prosecutor does sort of that process and can start that process and get it going. <coughs> Other questions? I thought I saw some other hands up. And then I have a question for our panelists. Um, you know, there's a lot, there was some discussion even earlier today about hate crimes sort of being on the rise. We also talked about statistics being, frankly, wildly inaccurate when it comes to this. Let's talk a little bit about whether you believe this is happening, what sort of evidence we have about sort of the rise or lack thereof of hate crimes in the last couple of years. Sure, so I have the mic, so I guess I'll start with that one. Um, and I'll start with, I, I skipped out in my background. I am a, a JD, I'm inactive, so I don't need the CLE credit. I'm not a PhD, nor do I hold a PhD in statistics, right? So um, numbers are, are very important, but numbers can be used in a number of different ways depending on who's, who's using them and what they want to achieve. Um, but as the, the, someone said earlier today, it definitely feels like they are on the increase, whether that's because they actually are, or maybe there's increased media reporting on it, or maybe because there's increased media reporting, people are reporting it more than they did in the past. There's a number of different factors that, are, that go into that play. Um, but regardless of that, every time I get a case, it's a, it's a fresh case that starts off me. The statistics are great. It's important to know the background and the landscape of where we're at um, in this time right now. But I have to look at each case individually based on the facts that's before me. Uh, when I go in a case, I can't present something that happened 50 years ago as evidence. In this case, I'm dealing with this victim, this offender, what happened in this case. So statistics are good to know, and obviously you need to be informed of that as a citizen. Um, but from an investigator standpoint, I'm concerned about that victim, that case, improving the case that's in front of me right now. Yes, I'm dodging the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just add from the city of Sugarland standpoint, I've actually checked our stats, and the answer to your question is no. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that something is not happening below, beneath our radar. So uh, again, we have to try and, and open our doors and, and try to build these relationships. But we have to ask, as, a, as an investigative officer, we have to ask pertinent and relevant questions. And sometimes those questions are uncomfortable. And so, I mean, we'll, we'll ask questions like, you know, what's the race, obviously, but did the victim recently move to the area? You know, that may be something they didn't know about. Is there, are there other residents and uh, other victims in the area that had these same type of uh, incidents going on? So we have to ask, where you been? Where are you coming from? Uh, where, where do you go out? Where do you hang out? Uh, who do you hang out with? Those kind of questions that may be a little bit uncomfortable, but we have to ask. So, and then we can, like I was saying earlier, we can classify these particular types of cases. And I don't have anything to say about the statistics of it, but I do know that the press has covered it um, and identified it as hate crimes when maybe legally amongst ourselves we might not get there. Um, and, and that's the, the one stat that I do know from Fort Bend County is that a case I think in the last couple of years that could have been filed as a hate crime, it ended up going with the feds. So. That's, that's a situation where it doesn't mean it didn't happen and it didn't happen here. It just meant that it, it was a better prosecution on the federal side than on the state side. But yes, I think we are aware of it more. We hear about it more. And I'm kind of interested to see what the statistics come back in the next two years. I'll add something as well to that, uh, speaking with our uh, the ch FBI chief over civil rights. Um, Statistics are very hard to come by in this community. And as we heard, like 50% of hate crimes are not even reported. I'll be honest with you, I've heard that statistic before too, and I've always questioned whether, we, how do we even possibly know that that's true? Um, we're talking about the very marginalized groups in our community who are not actively going out and reporting this. How do we know that they're not reporting it? How do we really know what the statistics are? Uh, back in 2009, I believe it was, when the uh, act uh, was first passed, there was legislation about putting in together a better statistics and asking all the different uh, components of law enforcement around the country to report. And unfortunately, a lot of that was voluntary reporting. And so while you may get an increase, I think it was 17% in the last FBI uh, numbers, that also could just be reporting an incident, uh, just more people are more reporting this, more jurisdictions. It's a very difficult thing uh, to sort of know whether it really is increasing or not. The media likes to take on a number and just get onto it. Um, but I would like to just sort of hear from the people in this room, you know, from your own perspective, do you guys feel like hate crimes have sort of increased in the last two or three years? Just for my show of hands, if you think that's true. It's about a fair, it's about a fair number. Um, certainly that's certainly feel that way a little bit to me uh, from my perspective. Uh, we have a question, yes. To the chief, um, <clears throat> say you respond to a uh, scene of a crime and you see all the evidence and in your head you see a victim who has suffered certain injuries and just based on what the witnesses are saying you feel like a hate crime has occurred mm -hmm. but the victim is hesitant to report it oh no I'm fine I'm, I'm okay does that happen I mean and you feel like that's not going to be reported I mean, can you kind of cajole the victim into Following up. I, the word conjole, I don't think we try to conjole them, uh, but we, <laughs> what we do is we look at literally the elements of the crime. And if the elements are there, we'll make the report. Uh, we may have a victim that said they do not wish to prosecute or do not wish to follow up with the case or as far as work with our investigators or our district attorney partners, but we look at what the elements are. And if the elements are there, we're gonna document it and we're gonna make the offense report. And then we'll work with our, our investigators, our district attorney investigators and determine, let them determine the prosecution of the case. And ultimately the prosecution will be done by the state of Texas, not the individual. So as right. opposed to a civil lawsuit where you're fighting over money and damages, the state of Texas for purposes of criminal prosecution is, is the party that goes forward. And there are times where we go forward and no one is our friend and no one is cooperating. We do that very typically on domestic violence cases where we feel we need to go forward to protect this person and to put a stop to this particular cycle of violence. So um, 
we would we would be in a position of, of working hopefully with a victim and and their support group to try to get them on board but yes we can go forward with that um, so my question is about the uh, rise in the number of hate groups um, in in the Houston area but elsewhere also and I was wondering if your offices or other offices in the government actually track and trace those but also find ways to curb their Efforts of stoking. Sure, I'll start off with that way. Uh, so hate groups often walk on the fringe of hate speech and hate crime, and they're all often very good at walking that fine balance. Um, um, I do not track individuals who are engaging in the freedom of their expression, even if it's um, offensive or hateful expression. Um, that's not something I do. I track um, criminal conduct and criminal uh, behavior. But uh, you know, we are aware that there are certain groups throughout the country that are, um, for some reason, are espousing um, hateful speech, and that hateful speech goes down the pattern, which eventually turns into hateful conduct. And we have to become, uh, our goal is to get, find out about it, stop it before it turns into offensive criminal conduct, but not impinge upon their freedom of speech. And that's a very um, challenging thing to do in law enforcement because we have to uh, respect individuals' right to have their freedom of speech, uh, but also protect individuals from being harmed because of hateful criminal conduct. I don't have much more to add to what he just said. Thank you. Well, however, if a uh, crime occurs, uh, the perpetrator will still want to look in his background as to membership in any such yeah, so the question was, if a hate crime does occur, then would we look into the offender's background, the fact that they're a member of a hate group, and the fact that they've made offensive, hateful comments in the past, that would become a factor, obviously, in a, a prosecution of that individual to establish their background. And there's a special um, question in the back from Ms. March from the ADL. Thank you. I, I, I just want to make a statement, and that is it's very hard to quantify. I'm uh, ADL. ADL, an anti-hate organization, tracks extremists and and follows their speech, which a meal can't do and law enforcement can't do. So ADL has a lot of information on hate groups and um, uh, individuals who hate. However, it's very hard to quantify. Everybody always wants you to quantify how many are there, are they increasing? Because the ways that a lot of the ways that we track them is online. And so online, you can look a lot bigger than you are. You can look smaller than you are. It's very hard to quantify those numbers. So, But if you do want information on um, ADL, that ADL has on hate groups, I'll be up on a panel in a few minutes probably <laughs> talking about it. Um, and you can come and talk to me, and I can help you find some information on that. Yes, Thank you, Amelia. Ms. Booth, yes. just out of curiosity, are you at liberty to mention the case that you said yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm an investigator with the county attorney's office. I just wanted to mention that DPS uh, creates a crime and census report yearly that <coughs> tracks hate crimes in the <coughs> Of course, you have the federal, and uh, my, I might want to address that, the federal uniform crime report that has done a tremendous job of tracking crime, particularly the hate crime re uh, reports and the tracking has gotten much better over time. Thank you. Yes. Two questions. Uh, it appears that the whole issue is very complex and very nuanced. And should the victim then be thinking about hiring their own counsel to work at liaison with the I get that question often from uh, victims, um, and my response is I actually find it to be an impediment a lot of times because the civil system and the criminal system are very different. Our, our levels of proof are different. Um, what we can present to a jury is, is different sometimes, and so I think it becomes more of an impediment. Um, I don't know of any situations, or I can think of very few, where 
anyone would have benefited in any way as a victim to have their own attorney. Um, you know, we, we as assistant district attorneys, we, we care very much about our victims or else we would not be here. Um, we certainly would not have this career. So uh, we're usually on the lookout for the best interest of our, our victims, even to the point sometimes of, I mean, there are very few far between, but there are times where we don't go forward because our victim is not in any condition to do so. And we may request continuances, or we may actually dismiss the case to refile later, but again, taking into account our, our victims, uh, where, where they are at that point in time. So no, I don't, I don't think it benefits the criminal prosecution at all to have a, a civil attorney there to represent the victim. Do you agree? I'd say on the federal side, <laughs> that would be a waste of time. <laughs> we have victim service uh, providers, we have victim service groups, we have representatives in our office, and we as prosecutors have experience dealing with victims. Yeah. Make yourself a direct resolution. Don't waste your money on that. But that's what, what about, about attorneys? What about community liaison people? Like dealing with cultural and language issues, kind of be the go between between the victim and, and the I, prosecutor's I, office. Has that been helpful? Has, have you had that incident? What's been I have not, but I can see how it would be helpful. Um, my probably most recent experience is with child advocates. <coughs> so they, they kind of liaison with the children um, and the families of the children and the prosecutor. And they're wonderful. They're, they're great. So I, I could see how that would be a great benefit. But I have not, I have not actually worked directly with a, uh, a citizen advocate. Okay. Other questions? Although we have to wrap it up here. Yes, yes. Uh, my question is to uh, Teresa. You mentioned earlier about uh, a lot of your, 95% of your cases are plea bargains. <coughs> yes. So if there's a really serious, heinous crime where death, you know, a fatality occurred, would you still try to proceed with a plea bargain or try to proceed with a trial to get the maximum sentence? Or how would you handle that? Every case has to be evaluated on its own legs. So we look at the people that are involved. We look at the facts that are involved. Um, obviously, a, a, a homicide type of case, we would be talking directly with the district attorney uh, for input. We also talk with the victim, or in this case, it would be the victim's family. They would be consulted before uh, anything is done. And again, I mean, it's the district attorney's office to make the recommendations concerning punishment, but we talk with people and we consult with them. Um, so th those are things that would be entertained. And yes, honestly, there are times where we step away from a maximum punishment because it's the best thing, it's the just result. Um, there are times where um, uh, putting people through a trial, I mean, those are, they're, it, they're difficult things to go through. They're not easy. Um, there's that to be weighed. There's the fact that a plea typically brings an end to the appeal process. And that is worth something. To know that, that you've got the finality of a conviction in place that's not gonna get overturned because of some possible error that, that you know, not even the prosecutor might have done. It may have been a, a judge ruling during a trial. That's worth something. And there are times where a plea bargain for something even less than the maximum would be the appropriate thing. There are times when that's not appropriate, and, and a trial is something that is sought after by the state. Um, but again, each case has to be evaluated based upon its own set of factors to get the just result. Okay, thank you. We've got about one last question over here. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I have one more question. You, uh, about the qualifying evidence, you all mentioned about the qualifying evidence, so my question about that is a lot of times Victims, I feel like the way y'all are describing is very hard to prove a hate crime, right? So, why would it, like, how do we encourage our victims to actually want to go report that when they know that it's so difficult? Like you said, that you have to have a video or you have to have qualified evidence or something. Like, the way y'all are describing it seems very difficult to prove it. So, a lot of times people are just going to be like, okay, let me just deal with this on my own. Let me go to a community member or a mosque or a church. Let's try to figure this out on our own. Also, uh, the city, sometimes like the city, when, like city of Sugar Land, 
when hate crimes are reported, um, people may fear that, you know, they don't want to report it because the officers will not believe them. Because I've had cases like that, I've worked in videos like that, and that has happened. How do we deal with the implicit bias of the officer that comes to the door? Mm -hmm. so, so I, I know it's hard to the same thing, but it's very important for us to understand this because I'm still not yeah. getting the answer that we need I'll do my best, but again, what, what we say, regardless whether it's, it's a hate crime up front or on the back side, we say report it. Report it first so that we can get the information and then we can classify it after the fact. But we want it to be reported, and, and we'll make the determination on if it's a hate crime or not. I think that may be a little bit of the confusion where a, a, a citizen may be trying to determine what type of crime this is. Or how this should be reported, and it should just be reported to the officers, and, and we go from there. Again, I go back to as far as our officers, we have to continuously provide training, education, and knowledge, cultural diversity training, working through all our different partners. Like I say, whether it's ADL or whether it's uh, community level training, we have to get that information out there. So. We just try to break down those barriers, but what we say is report the information to us and then let us determine it. If you have situations, as always, we have it on our website of how you can also make a compliment for an officer, but also make a complaint about an officer, whether they not you know, give you the correct information or the proper information or not being courteous and professional. So that's what I always encourage for my staff, and, and that's the type of stuff that we have to be held accountable. Just because we can't make a hate crime out of something doesn't mean a crime didn't occur and that it won't be prosecuted. Please call. Um, any Anytime anyone is injured or hurt or their property is damaged by intentional acts, that should be reported to law enforcement. And even if a case never comes out of that, it's still documented somewhere, and it could become important at some point right. to making a hate crime out of something in the future. So please report. Please encourage reporting. Yes. Well, on that note, I want to thank our panelists for their valuable advice. <laughs>